I hope that you've uh, <coughs> got your uh, notes with you from the e-bulletin. If you haven't, that's fine. Most of it will come up on the, uh, on the screen. But uh, as I've been saying, we've, we've been rethinking the church in this series. And uh, we're basing it on the key passage in Matthew 16, 18, which is mentioned in your, your e-bulletin. Jesus said, I will build my church. He doesn't guarantee to build anybody's church. He guarantees to build his church, which means that we need to find from him direction for the church. So where do we find the direction? From his word. And that's why it's so important to be engaged in his word because <clears throat> the, the word of God is, is powerful, it's active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides joint and marrow. It basically convicts us of the things that we shouldn't do and encourages us in the things we should do. So uh, we're into... <clears throat> Uh, rethinking the church, and we had six parts in that uh, series, and we're on the fifth part of this, one more next week, which we'll talk about the inclusive church. How do we embrace people into a fellowship who aren't part of what we're doing? And that's a really important aspect of community. But today we're looking at the safe community. Do you believe that God can break every chain? then the question is, why hasn't he done it in your life? You see, we make all these claims from the word of God that he breaks every chain, he sets us right, he gives us holy living and so on. But when we come under the word of God and we examine our lives, we find that there are many things where God still hasn't broken every chain. And that will continue to be the case till we pass from this planet. But hopefully we're progressing God doesn't ask us to be perfect because only he is perfect. We're perfect in position, but not in practice. And so what discipleship is all about is God making real in our lives what we already are in position. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus in the believer, there is the perfection. That's the ideal, that's the outcome. And what we're looking for now is progression over a period of time where each year, each month, we can look back and say, I've made some advancement in my spiritual life. And the sad case about many lives is that we go well for a while, two steps forward, maybe one step back, and then we often have periods where there's no steps forward and a few steps back, and sometimes we're turning around and walking the other way. And so uh, this message today is really about breaking some of the chains that bind people in terms of the viruses we mentioned last week. And what we're doing today is having a look at this issue of a safe community. And, and I know that many people are not engaged in churches because in some way they felt that the church community was unsafe. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, in intercessory prayer meetings, often people are not safe. Why? Because they get some information to pray about and it becomes the source of gossip and passing on under the guise of, well, will you pray for so-and-so? I heard that their marriage is falling apart. I heard that this and I've heard they're having an affair and... And the problem is you've just passed on gossip to other people. And so often the church community is not that safe. And so we've got to learn confidentiality. We've got to learn that God knows everything about a person's situation. We don't have to remind God. And often in our prayers we're reminding each other of the failing human beings that we're praying for. And so demonstrate our own failure. So I'm talking about the safe community, setting healthy relational boundaries. And uh, this is not just for the church, it's for families, it's for, for uh, marriages, it's for relationships with people around about you, it's for the workplace, and uh, you'd be aware that the bullying in the workplace and people who don't observe the, the social boundaries that should be there uh, we face a lot of those things and, and there's legal aspects now that we can go to 
in order to regain our safety. So this is a very important thing that we're talking about. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, the passage from Acts 2, 42 to 7, which is really a purpose statement for the church. The purpose of the church is develop in community, which we're looking at at the moment, fully committed disciples of Jesus Christ, which we've covered, who celebrate the life of God, who cultivate personal growth in Christ, care about one another in Christ, and communicate Christ to the world. So today, this healthy relational boundaries, how do we set them? What do they really mean? What is all this about? Is something that will be insightful for you to understand and hopefully start to work at some of these principles to put them into practice. So let's get into the big picture. Let me set the picture for you so that you realise this is a critical issue for any relational uh, interaction of people. When, what do you do when you find yourself in a family, social setting, workplace, with people who have obvious relational viruses? And we talked about eight of those that were just mentioned. There are others, but eight that were mentioned from a passage of Scripture and, and the antidote to those viruses. What do you do when relational viruses hinder Christian relationship in your local church community or in your relationships? More to the point, what do you do when the relational virus that dominates a person leads to personal attack, ridicule, gossip, negativity or coldness, particularly in Christian community or family? Now, I'm very much aware of this as a pastor of now, what is it, 30, 40 years or something. You can see I'm getting old, I can't even remember. But the issue here is that I've been attacked as a pastor in a church and severe attacks gossip, being maligned, people who are out to to destroy your ministry. And we're not talking about people out there that don't profess faith. We're talking about people who would stand up and proclaim their own righteousness. So what do you do when that happens? How do you respond? And of course, as you mature, you learn how to respond. And there are ways that are godly and ways that are not. We live in a world filled with people who have relational viruses. And what can we do to remain healthy and balanced, particularly in our response to these people? The world's also filled with people with unresolved anger. And I know that when uh, you're driving on a freeway, and I've had a lot of people travelling past me at high speed, and I don't think they're giving Winston Churchill's V for Victory sign. They're reminding me that you should not cross into my territory and yet they're breaking the law. You know, the uh, homes and neighbourhoods, workplaces and churches can be all anger-filled places where harsh words and actions can be hurled in each of our direction on a regular basis. Never be so uh, deluded to think that the church is not, in many ways, a microcosm of what's happening in the world. Because we're, we're human beings. The thing we share in common is human frailty and sinfulness. And yet the church should be above a lot of that because we have the power of God within to break every chain. And we've got to ask the question, why doesn't that happen in many cases? So how do we handle this environment? How do we establish healthy boundaries for these anger-filled relationships so often? And many of these anger-filled relationships aren't to do with the immediate interaction. They're rubbish that people carry with them that is unresolved. You know, the executive at work who's had a very difficult day and is not able really to say the things they'd like to say or the employee or whatever and they come home carrying this baggage with them, kick the cat on the way in, abuse the family, say various things. They're carrying stuff that's unresolved. It's rubbish they should have got rid of, but it's still there. You're understanding where I'm coming from on this in setting the picture? Because this happens everywhere. What if there's a controlling parent, a controlling boss, a controlling spiritual leader or friend in your life. I have, a, I have a series of books on spiritual abuse, 
from pastors, from leaders in churches who abuse other people in their demands and in their actions and their attitudes instead of being gracious people or embrace people into the family of God. What do you do with these things? What if people uh, seek to control you in ways that make you feel uncomfortable? Of course, we've got legislation handling uh, sexual abuse and all that sort of stuff and, and, and uh, abuse of various natures. But abuse happens in all sorts of forms, at all sorts of levels, in all sorts of relationships. How do you fend off the desires of other people to run your life? I don't know about you, but I'd love to have a say in my own life. And a lot of people walk around feeling, I don't have a say in anything that I do. There are so many people telling me what I should do, controlling me with attitudes and so on. How do we control that? How do you respond to people in your life who are constantly asking you to fix things for them or help them, even to the extent that you feel used and abused? I know that many uh, um, a uh, Christian worker suffers from compassion fatigue. You're so busy out there helping people because you do it unto God and then you help people because those same people you're helping make you feel guilty if you don't help. And so what do you do about that? We know people who, and I know many people, who are permanent counsellees. They keep coming and it's their hit for the week. They have someone listen, they have someone say, but they go away and don't change and don't do anything. And that's why when I'm counselling, I require people to do their homework and don't come back till you've done it. Unless you've got a reasonable excuse and we need to work on something else that needs to be fixed before you can actually move forward. Because there is a responsibility when you receive counsel to do something about the counsel. Many people want our time availability in their time of need or crisis. The problem is that their demands can use up all our available time and more and take us away from some of our primary responsibilities. Or to the detriment of our lives, we continue to give and give and give and give. And I know we need to give, but God gives us priorities that we need to meet. And it's not unchristian to say no. Sometimes it's the healthiest thing you can say. But others would look at it and sort of say, well, gee, you're failing in your Christian life if you were to say no, if you were to set a boundary, if you were to say, hey, enough's enough. How should we respond to these people who have received substantial help, even financial, many times and have literally blown it or misused or abused that help and now literally appeal to our faith or conscience again to help? I know in the past years I've had people say, oh, look, I don't want to be at this church. You don't care. I was in hospital. No one visited me. We've taken up the challenge in the past to go and check out how many people visited. And there was one person who had 12 visits in one week from people in their home group and people who were leaders to care for them. But their assessment was the senior pastor didn't visit. And I've said to uh, congregations in the past, If I were to try and visit every person equally on a large congregation, you might get a high and goodbye and that would be my visit. So the issue here is everywhere around us are pressures for us to do things, think things, behave in certain ways. How do you manage your life? How do you actually set boundaries from the demands of people? And some demands are good and some aren't so good. And in a world filled with relational viruses, we will catch every virus that comes around unless we have boundaries in our relationships. In other words, without strong, clearly understood and defined boundaries, relationships can be very unhealthy. Even with young people, when they first start going out together, they need to define the relationship and what are the boundaries of expectation so that people will not be disappointed because they've made up in their mind things that are supposed to be done, but no one ever talked about them. I remember talking to some really young children. There's my boyfriend over there. You've ever spoken to him? No, I haven't. It's all in here. But there are expectations. And if the one that they reckon they love or desire talks to someone else, 
they become quite jealous and upset about it. But there was no expectation that was ever defined. No boundaries ever set. And adults do the same thing. Without strong, clearly understood and defined boundaries, relationships can be very unhealthy. And it's unhealthy also to live in such tight boundaries that we've set that no one can come near you and you can't relate. There are other people who have set such tight boundaries as soon as they've heard about boundaries or in fact they've learned that from modelling from others. They don't let people in. They don't ever connect with people. They don't really relate to people. So they live in isolation, surrounded by people, but their boundaries are so tight that relationships that were potentially there never eventuate. So we need to create flexible boundaries that leave us open to love and to be loved while protecting ourselves from those who have got severe relational viruses and who can damage our hearts and our lives. Now, the term boundaries took uh, uh, the Christian world by storm with Cloudon Townsend's books on boundaries, boundaries in in your personal life, boundaries in marriage, boundaries in parenting, and they are incredibly good writers, and I've drawn on some of their stuff here for today. And probably one of the most definitive books on boundaries in just one volume is Boundaries in Marriage, for those that are married, to actually understood how a marriage should be actually negotiated and lived. But the trouble is many people haven't defined boundaries, haven't defined how you actually create them, don't know what to do. They just throw this word around. You're crossing the line. I've got boundaries. And the fact is, in a lot of cases, they're not well conceived or thought through. You know, strong and and healthy and godly relationships, whether in marriage, in family, in the workplace, should be based on love. That's what we're called to do, to love people, to love God, to love others as we love ourselves. Ephesians 5, 31 to 32, that passage on marriage. There are boundaries in there. And some people start on verse 22 and say, wives, you should submit to, to the husband. But they don't read verse 21 that says, submit to Christ and out of reverence, To him you submit to each other. Then boundaries that follow from there make sense. So people love to to cherry pick verses of scripture where they want to tell people what life should be about but they don't read the context. They don't read it as you're supposed to read scripture. And so we, we need to understand based on love. And of course, in 1 John 4, 16 and 18, it says you're to love God, uh, you're to love each other, and if you do not love others in the appropriate way, then you cannot say that you're loving God. Oh, that's a bit tough. So we need to understand that, that love is based on expressions of genuineness, being able to be true to oneself. You need to be able to reveal yourself, but you've got to let God work on the self that you reveal so that it's got a reflection of God in there. And secondly, there's got to be respect. Not only are you to be genuine on putting forward who you are, but you need to be respectful to let other people put forward who they are without criticism, without negativity. So it's a two-way thing, love and respect. Or genuineness, sorry, and respect. Then freedom, the ability to healthily disagree. You know, the thing about it is we don't have our mortgage on truth. And research psychology would tell us that we all have our biases. And most of our things that we think are truthful are based on our feelings and our intuition, not on fact. And I have so many people come in, and and I've got a couple I'm counselling at the moment, and I, I, it's just great to see them actually moving forward, but it's a very difficult counselling case. But they keep interrupting each other and saying, but the, but the real truth is this. In other words, I have the mortgage on truth and what I'm telling you is truth and what my partner's telling you is not truth. What do you do with that? We're going to redefine everything. And they're going to understand that what we think is truth is often not. It's our opinion. It's our feeling. It's our background that's coming out, not necessarily what is relevant for today. So we've got to have the ability to healthily disagree. And I've been watching a, I've been watching a really uh, great show, and I don't know whether you've ever watched it, but uh, 
uh, designated survivor. It's a, it's a, it's one of these series that goes on. I got Netflix a little while ago and thought I'm sick of watching, you know, Escape to the Country and Grand Designs and Yorkshire Vet and all this sort of stuff. My wife loves watching these things, but I get a bit bored. I've got to have something that intellectually challenges. And this is interesting because the whole of the American Senate and so on was blown up and they have a thing called designated survivor. Whoever survives, if there's only one, they have to become the president by default, I suppose, and, or by disaster, and then they've got to take up the reins. Well, this is about the story about the guy that was a designated survivor, an academic member of Congress, a really sharp guy, but the fact is he never wanted to ever be president of the United States and how he's growing, but his mannerism is amazing. And I was just watching last night, and, and there's a person that uh, he called in to have a talk with him and they'd awarded a medal for his writing but he totally opposed the American Senate and everything else. He was a radical uh, person. And the, the, the president said, I, I really want to award you this medal because it's for significant uh, public recognition of your writing. He says, President, I, I can't take the medal because... I just don't agree with what all this is about. And the gracious way he, he put that, he said, no, you've got to take the medal. He said, why? He says, because I want you to have that medal and I want you to keep writing without any pressure from me on what you're writing about because people need to hear different opinions so they can balance out their own. And I thought, whoa. He was embracing someone who was actually an opponent of what he was doing. But he said, I want you to take that medal. What's the catch, says the guy? No catch. I want you to keep writing as you're writing because people need to hear a difference of opinion. And instead of feeling threatened, we need to listen to the difference of opinion and be willing to accept that there are different ways of seeing things. And as we manage that and, and work it through, we often come up with what is closer to truth and what will work than what we had as individuals. And then finally, love has got to be based on responsibility. You know, people have said, and you've heard this so many times, God loves me unconditionally, just the way I am. One side of the coin. God loves me so much that he does not want me to stay as I am. And so we have a responsibility to respond to the unconditional love which, which pr presents a safe environment for us to grow up and change. And that's what the church has got to be. We will get God's awkward squad. We're probably one of, the, one of them ourselves. Extra grace required people because we've got some limitations and we need to be able to listen and work with each other so that we can help each other grow because love is an expression of God that basically says my greatest desire is for you to reach functional maturity. And whatever that takes, we're willing to keep working at it. So this is the starting point. So if you're going to talk about boundaries, you've got to start with love. And you've got to understand how that's to be expressed in general sort of terms. Expressions of genuineness, respect for others, Freedom of operation, responsibility, however, which creates the, the, the safeguard around all of those expressions. So now we come to the issue about what is a boundary. Now we live next door to people like you probably do. And one of the biggest illustrations of a boundary is your fence. Now I don't know whether you've watched on, uh, you know, the... the rubbish that goes on after Channel 9 News or something, which talks about, here's another problem between two neighbours. The tree hanging over the fence or the fact is they've moved the boundary or the fact there's no boundaries and the dogs are coming. All that sort of stuff's on there. And, and we know that. But a boundary is a property line. It's a property line. And the idea is to keep others from coming in so there's definition of where you live and what is yours. The boundary is not to control your neighbour. It's to keep your neighbour from intruding on what's yours, but it doesn't stop you speaking to your neighbour, relating to your neighbour, even coming on each other's property. I love the, uh, the ad in the... Um, 
I don't, I don't know whether you saw it or not, but I think it was related to the COVID-19 virus. But the people who had rejigged their back fences and they're all going to stay on their own property, but they fold down half the fence in every direction and they've got this big table. They all sit around and have a meal. And I'm thinking, they're still in their own area. They're not stopping, they're stopping people coming into their area, but they're still engaging. Now, what a great illustration. And so here, a boundary is like a property line which clearly marks out what we own and what we're solely responsible for. What do we mean by boundary setting? Boundary setting is an exercise in appreciating, accommodating and preserving each other's uniqueness, thereby building strong, dependable, workable relationships. So when we set boundaries, we're keeping other people from intruding in what's ours, but when we, we boundary set, we also do that so we can preserve integrity of the relationships that we're engaged with. It's not an exercise in trying to fix, change or punish another's behaviour. And in counselling, when people come in and say, this my husband or my wife or some other person or my boss has intruded into my life and they're running my life and I feel so, so, so uptight about it, and you teach them about boundaries, one of the immediate reactions is, I will now use these boundaries to control this person that's intruding. No, you're just trying to keep them out of what's yours. But you don't extend beyond there. See, your boundary fence in your property, you don't extend beyond to control the next door neighbour. Both of you preserve the boundary so that in actual fact you know what's yours and what's theirs and there's a mutual respect and an openness to discuss anything. So in, in this particular case... Boundaries, such as in the physical boundaries, are exactly the same, psychological, social, whatever, and spiritual boundaries that we would have to take on for our life and set boundaries, but still communicate in an open, godly and loving way with others. Included in that are feelings. You know, there's so many people who say, oh, what you did made me feel. I'm sorry, psychology would tell us nobody can make you feel anything. What happens is that when you think someone's intruded into your life, you form a judgment and associated with that is your feelings. And instead of saying, you made me feel, no, in response to what you did, I chose to feel this way. Oh, I pulled people up in counseling on this and they because it's counterintuitive to how the world thinks. You do something to offend me and I feel this, I feel anger. Well, there are people around who've had the same things done who don't get angry. The natural consequence of some sort of intrusion doesn't have to be an ungodly response. There are ways of actually working this through. And so the, you know, some people use boundaries for selfish reasons, control reasons to get their own way. And a lot of administrative stuff that happens in organisations is not so much to do with prospering the organisation, but to preserve the control of those in leadership. And, you know, as a a teacher of many years, one of the reasons for uniforms is to control the behaviour of children and have an excuse for it. It is. So, you know, you go to a fairly conservative sort of school and really tight controls. Hey, your socks are a certain length, your dress or whatever it is, and all that stuff happens... But in actual fact, it's pretty meaningless in life. The reason we have that there is so we've got a level of control. I I taught in one of those sort of schools once and they, oh, the control. Then I went to an experimental school. We We had first names of teachers and students. We had no uniforms, none of that sort of stuff. And the discipline was no different. The control was no different. We just learned to operate in a different the thing shifted from dress to character. And so I just say to you, we've got to look at this whole thing. And often people use boundaries because they're afraid to say yes or no. We pull out some rule or regulation because we're afraid to say yes, no, no, because this is what the company does. 
Well, you watch that designated survivor. There's a whole lot of rules and regulations, but the issue is sometimes you've got to breach them because it's not getting you anywhere. So how do we set appropriate boundaries? Let me just mention some ways. Words. One of the things you teach in counselling and one of the things you learn in teaching and other things is your word power is powerful. Now, remember, there's a rule, 738.55 rule. Only 7% of your message is your words, 38% is your tone of voice and 55% your body language. Now that's interesting, especially for husbands. My wife reminds me about this because of my husband. And she says, you're not listening to me. And I say, I can tell you every word you said. And she reminds me of what I teach. That's only 7% of the message. The other 93% you did not even understand because you weren't listening to my tone of voice and you were not listening to my body language. And as a counsellor, when people come in and talk, I'm watching all sorts of things. I'll give you hundreds of illustrations of that, but you can see in terms of the tone of voice, any quavering in the voice, whatever, the, the, you can see the blotches around the neck, you can see the, the, the shiny rim on the eyes where tears are close to the surface. You can, you can see in the body language, and uh, there's a massive amount of message that comes through that is in addition to the few words that are spoken. And so the, the, the issue is words are so powerful. And when you actually use words and link it with body language, tone of voice, it's interesting. And you teach people a gradation of words. A student that gets out of control. You can go over quietly and talk to the student. You don't have to rip out a big yell and scream to the back of the room. You basically go in and say, hey, listen, your behaviour's becoming a little bit annoying at the moment. You need to pick that up. Or you can go through, if they've been persistently like that, your behaviour is totally unacceptable, you are annoying me immensely, and I want to tell you, even though I'm quiet in voice, I'm ready to do something drastic that you'll regret for the rest of your life. The issue is our word power is very important, and some people immediately jump to levels of word power that are so much in extreme to what is happening It makes a mockery of the situation. But there are other people who should be able to express more powerfully with their words, not the loudness of their voice, but with their words. They often say, you know, does this matter to you? Oh, no, no, it doesn't matter. When in actual fact, they're screaming out within and saying it more than matters. You're killing me off. And so words are powerful. Consequences. Back in the 70s, uh, last century, by the way, we're talking about. We haven't got to the one this century. But uh, uh, Glasser had a book out and a, a therapy called Reality Therapy, which is used for wayward children, uh, people who are uncooperative in prisons and so on. You don't have to yell and scream and carry on. You go over to them. I use this all the time in teaching. And I go over to a person and said, well... And in fact, I've done it with a whole class where I've had teaching teachers to teach and and the issue has been where they're yelling and screaming and they just about, the teacher needs to be put away for a couple of months. The fact of the matter is, if you go to a student and you sort of stop and end the class, quiet for a minute, or you write on the board without any expression at all, your misbehaviour has led to 15 minutes detention and you sit down and keep on with your work. Then you get up in another few minutes, your misbehaviour has added another 15 minutes to detention. And I can guarantee you that every one of you will serve your time. I found that I could get control of a class almost immediately. Because what happens is the good kids start tackling the bad kids. You divide and you rule. You see, you're consequent. You do this, I do that. You misbehave in the prison, you go into solitary confinement. We're not going to argue about it. That is the fact of life. That's reality. Now make your choice. You see, you're setting boundaries. And so words, consequences, then secure emotional, physical distancing. I gave some advice to a person. I said, don't take up the negativity with a person. Don't try and defend. You just keep away from them for a while. Set your boundaries further out so they can't intrude in your emotional and mental life. We go further and we look at 
uh, external assistance from others as third parties. And when people can't set boundaries, they often come to a counsellor and you sit down with them and you help them work out boundaries and then hold them accountable. You can go further and you can take time out. And sometimes, even in marriages, time needs to be taken out, but it needs to be supervised. So what I'm saying is there are multiple ways of setting boundaries. And we need to learn them because we need to have a, 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 a multi-approach to how we actually negotiate with others. And if you've only got two limited tools in the toolkit in handling difficult people, then the fact is they'll probably walk all over you. Or if you're the abuser in this situation, you'll walk over other people because in actual fact you don't observe their limited capacity to handle things. Now, when you're, when you're setting boundaries, there are ten relational laws to be considered in setting boundaries. I've found these incredibly helpful. Because when you're setting boundaries, they shouldn't be just a, you know, a, a, a flippant, well, I've just thought of doing this. We should start to have a process, a grid against which we measure and assess our boundaries. And here they are, and you'll find most of these are found from Scripture, if not all. The law of sowing and reaping. Actions require consequences, but the consequences have got to be proportionate to the actions. The law of responsibility. We are responsible to each other, not for each other. Do you understand the difference? You see, when we say we're responsible to another person, we're saying they have the right to rule what we're about. No, I'm responsible to another person, but not for them. And there are so many people whose lives are actually controlled by feeling an oversense of responsibility. I've got a man whose marriage is falling apart. Why? Because in the past, he's had this strong sense of responsibility, but his wife passed away, and now that's still there, but responsibility to other people is not as high as it should be. The law of power. We have power over some things. We do not have power over others. We're not there to change people. We have power over ourselves, hopefully, under God. We have power over our possessions and finances and so on. We can take strong action there, but we don't have power over other people in a general sense. The law of respect. If you want others to respect our boundaries, we've got to respect theirs. The law of motivation. We must be free to say no before we can wholeheartedly say yes. Oh, think that one through. You see, the issue is when we're strong enough within ourselves, we're, we should be able to say to someone's approach that we should do such and such, we're able to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. Because until we can say no, we can't really say yes honestly. Because what happens when we say yes to something we want to say no to, we bury that inside and that now becomes a problem when we're dealing with that person. When we go further, the law of evaluation. We need to evaluate the pain that our boundaries cause. We can see that in the physical world. The person you're living or the place you're living next to, they put up this massive big fence. We've seen a few of them on television there. Now there's no sunlight, there's no nothing, their view's gone and this person said, well, it's my boundary. No, it's not. You've got a boundary with another person. You are inflicting pain. The way in which we treat other people, we can inflict pain by the way we do things rather than progress in the relationship. The law of proactivity. We take action to solve problems based on our values, wants and needs. So we can be proactive on those, but are we talking solely about our wants rather than our needs? And are we intruding on another person's boundaries in what we're doing? The law of envy. We will never get what we want if we focus outside our boundaries onto what others have. Whoa. Keeping up with the Joneses. Looking at other people and saying, well, I should have that because they've got it. There's a whole lot of stuff in there that we need to look at. The law of activity. We need to take the initiative in setting limits rather than be passive. And I always all say to people all the time, and, and again in ministry, I've always put the situation, this is what I'd, I put you as a possibility to you, 
but I'm not going to tell you you've got to do it. You are free to make your choice. You're free to say no. And, and, and if you do say no, then I'll have to find someone else or do it myself. But I don't press people into service in a church. The issue is I'm proactive to say what we want, proactive to address a problem, but I don't try and force my... All these things are like a balance. It's like the attributes of God. You can't take one attribute against everything else. You can say, well, grace is it. Grace, and I, people write books and say, grace is it. Everything is grace. Well, it's not. There's holiness. There's love. There's rebuke. There's discipline. You see, the, the issue is the perspective comes on looking at a grid by which we evaluate what we're doing. And in our evaluation, and these are just giving us some ideas, in these laws, what we do is we start to reach God's perspective, not just ours. And the, the law of exposure, we need to communicate our boundaries to each other. And when we do that, we know where we stand. And we can go further to challenge people, but the fact is we should not come challenging, expecting they'll do what we want. Now, setting internal boundaries, we can become more loving and lovable. It's necessary. If we're going to have boundaries in relationships, we need to set boundaries in our personal lives. We need to get rid of some of the things that would block our objectivity in setting boundaries. And so things like perfectionism, judgmentalism, denial, withdrawal, irresponsibility, all of those things, I've listed them in the notes. The fact is, these are the things that we need to look at because they, these are often our internal viruses. And if we're... It, it's almost like... This, is, this pandemic is excellent for giving us models of what we, we actually do in our emotional, spiritual life. Because the issue is when we sort of wander around with irresponsibility in a, a pandemic and we decide we'll go here and meet, eat there and associate here, we drop off that virus everywhere and it spreads exponentially. And when we don't handle what's within ourselves first so that we've got a fair handle on that and we're trying to be godly in all of this and have some grid to work with, how can we go and expect boundary uh, observation from other people in our lives when in actual fact we might be the one creating the problem? And so I've listed that in there as something to understand. Now we come to a biblical portrait. I'm not going to read all that. You've got it in your notes. But we had an issue with Moses when he was handling the children of Israel and it's in, found in Exodus 18, 13 to 27. And here we have him with, with a large number of people that he's handling and he's out in the desert. And the fact is, everyone was bringing to Moses their problems. And the poor guy was basically compassion fatigue and, and struggling with all of these things that are brought to him. And, and, it, and it's interesting, his father-in-law, God bless him, came to Moses and said, Moses, you're going to burn out. We need to do this systematically. We need to set up various levels, and we'll get people to be managers or overseers of certain groups of people, and if it's too tough for them, we'll take it to the next level, next level, until finally only a small number of those things that are absolutely crucial will come to you. So Moses was peopled out. He was suffering compassion fatigue. He was burning out through handing the problems of a large number of people disgruntled, wandering in the wilderness looking back to Egypt rather than the promised land. And the old saying was that, uh, uh, and you've heard it probably many times, it wasn't so hard to take people out of Egypt, but it was a lot harder to take Egypt out of the people. And the big deal about all of this, it's, it's, it's not so hard to set the boundaries, but it's a lot harder to get the problems that cause the, the boundary problems out of the people so they're actually doing it the right way. So let's sharpen the focus a little bit. Many people in boundary setting make the mistake of moving from a boundary less to a boundary bound life. In other words, we have a, a continuum. On one side, we have people who don't set boundaries and they become the, the pawn, if you like, in the game of people's power. On the other hand, we have people who set such tight boundaries, they actually rule the roost. 
And so we, we need to, to avoid boundaryless living and we need to avoid boundary bound living where we've just got no room to breathe or relate or, or to, to control our environment. And what we need to live with is, is flexible boundaries, boundary-determined lives. Not boundaryless or boundary bound, but boundary determined lives. We live our lives under definition of what it should be, and we've set up reasonable boundaries. So, in other words, in the physical sense, it would be like moving to a new estate which you've got no boundaries at all, so everybody intrudes in everyone else's property. Or you go to the inner suburbs where everything has got fences and, and don't go here and prohibited there, where you can't really move. And my son's just in, in London there and, uh, with his wife. And he said, he could not believe, he said, I, I, my, my radical rebellious nature started to rise up because everywhere we've gone in these places, do not enter here. Do not allow, not allowed to do that. You go in even to, uh, to Oxford or Cambridge and we've been there with him. And the interesting part about it is they've got lawns. Only these people are allowed on this lawn. They've got signs up everywhere. And he says, oh, that's annoying me so much. We see a park that we could walk into. There's no fence, whatever. And all of a sudden, there's a little thing in there that says, do not enter. Do not do this. Do not. And the fact is, what we need to do is to be people who have some low offences, some people who actually communicate, so it's boundary determined. We know what's ours, we know what's other people's, and we learn to communicate to reach agreement on things in life in a godly way. And so uh, uh, living without boundaries, you begin to shrivel up inside and die. You, you have a hard time identifying your feelings and your preferences because you spend all your time playing doctor to people who want to manipulate your life. And it's not a good way to live. You can become bitter and angry, feeling used and abused. You keep a veneer of civility and concern for others, but you resent being taken for granted. That's not a healthy option. And then some people, and, and it's, it's interesting, some people set up such high walls and then complain about being in isolation and having no friends. And you see, one of the difficulties is every wall that you put up to keep people out stops you from getting in. Isn't that true? And, and you, you look at it and you think, golly, you can go to, I go down to Sanctuary Cove to a few places. They've all got massive big high fences. They've got security alarms and everything else. And the only time they meet is when they're in their little golf buggy that's probably labelled with BMW or some other thing. And they meet down the shopping centre for a pretty casual deal. But they really live in isolation. So what they've done is they keep people out and let everybody know you do not come in here, but the fact is nobody comes in. And they complain that they're in this rich environment, but the trouble is they're not relating to anyone. So the, the issue is we need to have flexible boundaries. And this is where Jesus was interesting because when he went to a party or celebration, he mixed with tax collectors, he mixed with all sorts of people, but he had clear boundaries as what was life, what was holy, what was acceptable to God, but he was able to cross boundaries because he knew what was his, he knew what was theirs, and he would encourage them to see the value of entering into the boundary-filled life under God. And understand the prescriptions given by God are not legalistic, they are there to free us, not to bind us. And the trouble is, and I'm dealing with certain people, I'm saying the trouble is you do not understand what the Christian life is. The Christian life is not observing rules and regulations. I'm a Christian because I do this and don't do that. That's not biblical. The Christian life is one in which we recognise that we're sinners and fallen people, we've been saved by God's grace, we're not perfect but we're progressing and that God gives us freedom to make choices and decisions and he walks with us to help us work out how best to enact our freedom responsibly. And when we do that in his power, what happens? We live the joyous, free Christian life. And the trouble is with many Christians who haven't understood this stuff, they wear a beware of the dog sign. I wonder why people don't come near them because the whole deal is they're always prohibitive. Don't do this, don't do that, and I'm doing that, and they're promoting comparisons. The issue is that's not freedom, that's bondage. 
And so in all of this, we're talking about having flexible boundaries, not absence of boundaries, boundaryless, and not over controlled by boundaries, bound by boundaries. We're talking about flexible boundaries. We know what's ours, we know what someone else's is, we exercise love, we accept people, we talk to people, we try to understand where they're coming from. And that builds compassion, it builds relationship, even when we learn to disagree with each other. And when others want to condemn you and falsely challenge, you have to be well defined and have boundaries that allow you to fully cope with those sorts of individuals. Flexible boundaries give us the ability to have discernment, protect ourselves from being hurt over and over again, open ourselves up for new periods of growth and uh, uh, development. And so we need to ask, you know, the questions, how, when, whom, why, when we set boundaries to understand our position in this whole thing. So finally, putting yourself in the picture. I've put down there some, some processes and the scriptural verification of that. For example, you need to pray and study God's word. Find out what God's word said. Find out what the spirit is saying to you directly. Be open to God's guidance in all of this. How should I handle this situation? As a person, how should I allow freedom in other people's lives? Let me understand from your word and from your spirit. And James 1, 1 to 8 says, If you lack wisdom, ask God, but don't be double-minded when he gives it. Proverbs 3, 5 or 6, Lean not on your own understanding, but, but trust God and he will direct your paths. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the word of God is there to develop us, to grow us, to check us out. So first thing is to pray and study God's word. Secondly, self-examination. Examine the boundaries. that you, Are you boundaryless? Are you boundary bound? Are you flexible? Where are you inflexible? Start working that through to develop decent relationships. The references, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. Quoted earlier in the, in the, in the, in the service. The word of God is alive, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, D judges the intents of the heart. Everything in life is laid bare before God from his word. Psalm 139. Search me, O God, try me, search my heart, see if there's any wicked way in me. And in the, the Gospel of John and also in, in the uh, Epistle of John, basically it talks about if you say that you love God, and hate your brother, you don't love God. Poor. And that's relational evaluation. Where are your relationships? What can be done in this boundary setting, virus removal, etc., to actually improve those? And establish an action plan. Be intentional. Don't just let it drift and say, oh, well, it'll work its way out, because knowledge is not wisdom. Applied knowledge is wisdom. And so you've got to apply what you learn for it to be able to go from here down to the heart so you become that sort of person. And then finally, if it's, it's all too much, you've developed action plan and so on, seek counselling as needed. And the scriptures say, you know, the, the counselling of people. There's wisdom in, in many counsellors. But when people speak into your life from an objective position, that can lead to massive change. So there's the issue of boundaries. Health, setting healthy relational boundaries and for a church to be the church of God and moving next week to be the inclusive church, we have got to learn to grow up and be able to relate to anybody, setting appropriate boundaries, removal of viruses, being able to tolerate differences of opinion so that we can work together for the glory of God because none of us have the mortgage on all truth. This is such an important message. And I don't think there would be a week pass when I've not counselled many people who this applies to, and especially last week's message, the relational viruses and now uh, setting healthy relational boundaries. So next week we're going to work through the last of the messages on community, which will be how to have an inclusive community. Do you want your church to grow? If you do, you've got to include other people. And those other people probably won't be like you. Get ready for it. You know, people say, I love mankind. It's just people I can't stand. Well, what we've got to do is start to understand that God will bring all sorts of people across our path. And sometimes I believe he does that 
because we need to learn a different perspective. And what was the attractive thing about Jesus? He could talk to anybody. A tax collector, a prostitute, a sinners. He didn't have a problem. The problem he had with people who try to control other people without looking at their own lives and seeking God's guidance. So let me pray for you. You know, it's a privilege to be able to share these messages because uh, they're doing an awful lot of my, in my life as I prepare them. It's almost like, whoa, three fingers back to me saying, well, look at your own life. Where are the weaknesses? Do something about them. And I understand and teach this stuff, but the reality is it's a different thing than understanding and teaching it than living it out. Let's just pray together as we finish our service. And uh, Where's your Sony? There he comes. You come out and get ready to, to lead us in Young as well. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity of meeting this way. We know it's still not ideal. We're not all together as a community. But Father, wherever we are, we are in some form of community. Help us to set healthy boundaries and, and addressing the viruses that we carry, knowing we're not perfect. But Father, that the outcome of all of this will be a community that reflects genuine love, genuineness, respect, freedom, responsibility. And so, Father, help us to be that sort of community because we do hunger and thirst after you. We desire that your church be built and we want to be part of the advancement of your kingdom. Help us to play our part. Help us to apply these truths in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.